Okay, friends, today and tomorrow we are reading chapter 23 of Matthew. We're going to do things just a little bit different. Tomorrow what we're going to do is look at the whole of chapter 23, but there is a lot of context that I want to cover today. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, some of you will be very excited about what we're talking about uh, today. I am very excited about these kinds of things, and some of you will not. Some of you will find this tremendously boring, but I promise you, if you stick with it, it will be illuminating to help you understand things in Matthew uh, that haven't made sense so far, and possibly for your whole life, some of these things. It will, it will help make more sense of things. What I want to talk about today is what, broadly speaking, Judaism looked at the time of Jesus. Huge caveat. I am in no way an expert in all of this. I am a student in all of this. It's something that I've been studying over the last, I don't know, four or five years. I, my eyes have been open to it more, um, and I am still studying all of this. We could sit in a semester-long course on this, and you and I would learn almost the same amount. I mean, what I know is this much. What there is to know is this much. But what I want to do today, briefly, is show you this much. If you were to ask, what does a first century Palestinian Jew believe about X? Well, the answer would be, which first century Palestinian Jew are you talking about? I used this example earlier in the week, but were I to ask you, hey, what do the Longhorns believe about the prospect of going to the SEC? What do the Longhorns believe about uh, the football program right now? Well, you might say, well, my one friend thinks this and my other friend thinks this. The Jewish people at the time of Jesus were not unified in everything that they thought. This shouldn't be surprising to you. Okay. It's just that we want to make things simpler than they actually are. At the time of Jesus, you have got, you know, five kind of schools of thought or five groups of people who believed different things when it came to how to practice their faith. And all of this really centers around the question of what do we do about the fact that we are an occupied people who are living underneath the rule of a government and a foreign people who believe very, very different things than we do about how the world works. So the question is, what do we do in response to, to Rome? Now, these five groups had grown up before uh, and were established before Rome was around. It was really Alexander the Great's conquest of what we now call the Holy Land of Israel that really got these groups kind of in their separate areas. But at the time of Jesus, um, that's what I want to talk about. Who are these groups? Sadducees, you've heard that word. Pharisees, you've heard that word. Herodians, it pops up a couple of times in their Gospels, but it's not a group that we really talk about. Essenes, who, I don't even know that word ever shows up in the Gospels. I don't think that it does. But everybody at the time would have known who they were. And then the, the zealots, who they don't talk a lot about, but we run into some people who are zealots. Who are these groups of people? Let's start with the Sadducees. The Sadducees is the ruling class uh, there in Jerusalem. They are all priests. So not all priests are Sadducees, but all Sadducees are priests. In fact, before Rome, it was the Sadducees, these priests, who were actually running things in Israel. And they quickly, once they kind of ascended to power, quickly became, became a very, very corrupt group of people. There are not many of them, um, uh, but they are very, very powerful, and they um, uh, are very, very wealthy. So it's a wealthy group of folk who live in palaces, who have a lot of power, and are very concerned with keeping that power. So when Rome shows up, they are out of power. So what do they do? Well, they basically... Um, uh, begin uh, uh, working with Rome. There are a lot of details around that, but they are kind of in Rome's uh, pocket. So that is uh, the Sadducees. Jesus does not interact with the Sadducees very much. In fact, it's not until the end of his life that he really inter interacts with them closely, the week that we're looking at right now. You've also, then let's talk about the Herodians. The Herodians are non-priests who essentially have the same philosophy as the Sadducees. So they are folks who say, we certainly worship God, we believe in God, um, but we also love this Roman culture, or before the Roman culture, the Hellenistic like uh, culture that the Greeks brought. We love um, the entertainment, we love the art, 
We love all of that stuff. So if you're a Herodian, your house is going to be a house in which you worship God, but you've also got Greek art and all of those things. If you want a group of people that we are the closest to today, it would be the Herodians. We worship God, but yet we also love the culture, right? I mean, we love um, uh, Western culture and all that it uh, that it, it affords us and the entertainment and all of those things, even though we know that some of the ways in which we are influenced by culture actually runs counter to um, the influence that God has has in our lives. Okay, so that's the Herodians. Sadducees and Herodians, very, very similar, just some of them are priests, some of them aren't. The Essenes. The Essenes are on the other end of the spectrum. The Essenes say, um, well, the, the, the priestly class with the Sadducees is so corrupt that we are out of here. So they physically remove themselves from Jerusalem and go out and establish different communities, including the one at Qumran, which is uh, over by the Dead Sea, which is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. So they remove themselves and um, seek to be faithful in a very radical way, removed from society. And they are eagerly anticipating the day in which God will return through the Messiah, and they are preparing for that day. There's a good chance that John the Baptist was either himself an Essene or raised in an Essene community or at least influenced by the Essenes. If you're looking for um, kind of uh, analogs in today's society, uh, think like the Amish with the Essenes. Think um, your version of like a corrupt um, pastor or religious system that really seems to be out for itself. Think that with Sadducees. With the Rodians think um, me and you like think like us. Okay, um, then uh, you get the zealots. Okay, when you think zealots, think extremists. Think probably terrorists. Okay, so these are folks who are so concerned about what is happening with Rome that they um, don't remove themselves like the Essenes, but they had that same kind of zeal. That's where zealots come from, and they're actually going to actively fight against. Um, uh, Rome. There are organized uprising at times. There are assassinations at times. This is who this uh, this group is. And note that Jesus calls at least two zealots to be followers of his. Um, and yo, well, we'll get to how Jesus interacts with us in a minute. Okay, so that's the zealots. And then think Pharisees. Okay, Pharisees are the ones that we hear the most about, and the ones that in chapter twenty-three Jesus really rails against. Well, here's the interesting thing with Pharisees. They get such a bad rap because they're the ones that Jesus interacts with the most. Um, Jesus lives in kind of Pharisee territory. I mean, it's the it's Pharisees that really establish these towns around, the, around uh, the Galilee where Jesus lives. And what is a Pharisee? Well, a Pharisee is someone who is devoted to the Scriptures and devoted to, uh, to obedience. They don't remove themselves from society the way that the Essenes do. And they are not going to be violent the way that the zealots are, but they are no less devoted to the study of God's word and to, to obedience to, uh, to God's word. Hey, it could be argued that if Jesus, Jesus doesn't fit in any of these categories, but that if Jesus, if you're talking about who Jesus is the closest to, he's going to be the closest to the, to the Pharisees. He spends three years interacting with the, the Pharisees. So when you get to the critique that we're reading today, he is critiquing kind of the, the group that he is the that he is the closest to. Um, that that certainly are not seeing the full picture, but that maybe are getting it more than most people are. So those are the five main groups that you've got. I think underneath the surface, a lot of what is happening is that people are trying to figure out, all right, Jesus, how do you fit in these camps? Like, do you, you, you fit cleanly into one of these camps. And of course, just like today, like when people study us today, what will they talk about? They'll talk about the Democrats and they'll talk about the Republicans. And then you, what, what people will fail to miss is the nuance of the fact that you had a lot of people that weren't hardcore Democrats or hardcore Republicans either, right? So you, you, do, you, you have ordinary people that maybe, you know, have an affinity towards one of these groups or the others, but can't be clearly defined as any of these things. So you've got you've got that whole group. People are trying to figure out who is Jesus. Well, he has a lot of zeal, but which is why people are expecting him to maybe raise an army. But when people pull out swords, he actually tells them to put them away. He's not he's not a zealot. 
God, he, he is extreme in the way that he practices his faith. And he is often off by himself praying. He spends 40 days in the wilderness here. He is then spending all night in prayer at other times. He, he is influenced by John the Baptist, but he's not removed from society, so he doesn't seem to be an Essene. He's certainly not a Sadducee. I mean, one, he's, he's not a priest, and two, he's not like a, living in these palaces. He's certainly not a Sadducee. Um, the Herodian thing's a little bit different because, again, like, but, he, but he, he, he doesn't really talk about this specifically, but he doesn't seem to be taken by culture the way that the Herodians are. Is he a Pharisee? Maybe, but he's, he, he, he's often condemning the Pharisees. So what is he? And what you begin to realize is he doesn't fit any of these categories. So what, what does this have to do with us today? If we cleanly fit into any of the categories that society puts uh, on us, it is likely that we are not actually following in the way of Jesus. If, if we, if everything that we believe falls perfectly in line with any kind of political platform, whether it be the Green Party or some Libertarians or obviously the Democrats or Republicans, if we fit cleanly into any of those platforms, we probably need to examine ourselves. One of the things that I know that I have to pay attention to is that there are times when one side of the aisle or the other will do things that are just so off-putting to me that it, 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 there's a temptation to push towards one of the poles. I have to realize, I, I, I don't, I preached on this this summer, I, it's not a game that we as followers of Jesus are actually called to play. We're not playing a red and a blue game. We're not playing a Sadducee, Pharisee, Herodian, Essene game. That's not what we're Zelligan. That's not that's not what we're doing. Jesus doesn't fit into those categories, and nor nor should we. Okay, so I think that's an important thing for us to kind of think about. Jesus doesn't fit in the categories, nor should we. But then the context also helps us to understand some of these arguments. And here's what we're gonna see. Jesus here is beginning to interact with the Sadducees for the first time. And here's what we're gonna notice. He spent three years with the Pharisees, and he has critiqued them and they've critiqued him, and they've become very, very frustrated with him at times. But Jesus has survived that. Note this. The Pharisees are not the group of people that put Jesus to death. He spent three years with them. Jesus shows up, and he begins critiquing the Sadducees. This is who he's critiquing when he turns over the, the, the tables in, the, in the, uh, the temple court. He begins critiquing the Sadducees. He begins going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, and it takes them a week to kill him. <laughs> they put up with this for a week. This is important because of this. It is not the Jewish people as a whole that put Jesus to death. It is a small group of their corrupt leadership that put Jesus to death. That's who it is. We as Christians have to remember this. We, we were born out of the Jewish faith. Jesus is a Jew. It is not the Jewish people as a whole that reject Jesus. It is a small group of leaders in the religious establishment that are so concerned with themselves and so obviously not concerned with what God is doing in the world, these Sadducees, that, 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 that put him to death. I hope this context is making sense. And if you want some more resources around that, email me. And I can give you some more resources around that, some ways that I'm learning about this right now. And I hope, again, that it is convicting for us to think, okay, am I more defined by the way of Jesus or more defined by culture as a whole, like, a, like the Herodians, or one particular kind of party, like the Sadducees or the, uh, the Pharisees? Okay, hope some of this makes sense. I don't know. Told you, I told you that some of you would, would not like this. Hopefully some of you. It's helpful. Um, tomorrow we're going to look at 23 and um, what it is that Jesus is saying specifically to this one party of the Pharisees. God bless you, friends. I'll see you then.